Now that we've looked at a small cross-section of historical examples of government-sponsored terrorism, let's fast forward to the horrific attacks of 7-7 in London. Prime Minister Tony Blair, leader of the Labour Party, was facing an uphill battle in parliamentary elections. National polls showed that his pro-war party was sure to lose. And then right on time, the bombings of 7-7 and 721 occurred. Within days of the London bombings, evidence began to emerge indicating Western intelligence agency involvement. I traveled to London from Austin, Texas to personally investigate. Once I arrived, I was met by Paul Joseph Watson and his brother Steve Watson, who are reporters for my news website, PrisonPlanet.com. <laughs> to understand the London bombers and who perpetrated them, you first need to look at 3-11-2004, the bombings in Madrid, Spain. Years after the blast that rocked trains in the city of Madrid, Spain, the government admits that Al-Qaeda had no connection to the attacks. Every one of the supposed bombers had intimate links to the Spanish security services, including the head of their bomb squad. The alleged leader of the bombers, who reportedly gave dynamite to the terrorists, was connected to the Madrid bomb squad. And we see the exact same earmarks, the same M.O., in the London bombings that we witnessed in Madrid. On the morning of July 7th, 2005, three trains and a city bus were ripped to pieces when four military-grade explosive devices detonated. At 8.50 a.m., three explosive devices simultaneously detonated on three separate trains. Within minutes, eyewitnesses were reporting to the press that there had been multiple terror attacks. Despite the fact that three train cars were burning wrecks, strewn with dead and dying Londoners, Scotland Yard for over an hour and a half claimed that all of the disruptions were simply caused by a power outage in the London Underground. Power surge on the Underground, that's all we heard. Um, I mean, the bus was about an hour after the, the Underground, so... That's when I think everybody knew that it wasn't, it wasn't what it was, you know. I think it was just an excuse, power surge, whatever. Why would they say that, though, knowing it wasn't? They're trying to cover up, probably, you know what I mean? So there wasn't no panic and everybody used to all like, just get on with everything, you know, so... Then, mysteriously, 50 minutes into the attack, the London Police Department orders the number 30 Hackney to Marble Arch bus to leave its normal route and to park at the corner of Woburn Square and Tavistock Place. At 9.47, a fourth bomb detonates, killing 13 civilians and injuring many others. Note, out of several hundred buses in service that morning, it's the only bus that the police take special control of and direct to Tavistock Square. I've been walking up and down this road, looking at the bus stops for a number 30. The bus stops have all the numbers of the buses on them individually. There's no number 30 on any of the bus stops. That's because the number 30 bus was specifically rerouted here on that day. To simplify it, there's no bus stop here. There's no number 30 bus stop here, no. Well, that was in the news that it was specifically diverted here. They admitted that the number 30 bus was the only bus that was directed to a different area of the city. For what reason, nobody knows, but they admit that. So it's very strange that for no reason it would come down this road when it was bombed. Remember, while all this is happening, the police are on radio and TV telling everyone that it's just a power failure, an outage. Meanwhile, commuters on the bus were listening to other radio reports where eyewitnesses were reporting explosions. 
the supposed bomber on the bus with the rucksack became panicked and began looking in his rucksack in what witnesses said was a confused and frightened manner. Weeks later, police detectives investigating the case said that all four of the bombers on the three trains and the bus didn't fit the M.O., the modus operandi, of bombers. They bought two-way tickets. They'd played games of cricket the night before. They had good jobs and happy families. One of the alleged bombers was caught by surveillance camera arguing with the ticket clerk about the price of his pass. After Scotland Yard detectives had a chance to talk to some of the eyewitnesses from the bus and the trains, they stated clearly on the record that they believed that the bombers did not know that they had explosives in their backpacks. This was only one of many huge developments in the case that only received bare mentions in the back of the newspaper. The July 29th edition of Fox News Channel's Dayside program revealed that the so-called mastermind of the 7-7 bombings, Harun Rashida Swat, is a British intelligence asset. Former Justice Department prosecutor and FBI terror expert John Loftus exposed the fact that a SWAT was being protected by MI6 and was clearly under their control. A SWAT is believed to be the mastermind of all the bombings in London from on the 7 7 and 7 21. This is the guy, we think. This is the guy, and what's really embarrassing is that you, the entire British police are out chasing him. And one wing of the British government, MI6, or the British Secret Service, right. has been hiding him. And this has been a real source of contention between CIA, Hold on, John. Justice Department, and Britain. MI6 has been hiding him. Are you saying that he has been working for them? Oh, I'm not saying it. This is what the Muslim Sheik said in an interview in a British newspaper back in 2001. So he's a double agent, or what? He's a double agent. He he for the, so he's working for the Brits to try to give them information about Al-Qaeda, but in reality, he's still an Al-Qaeda operative. Yeah. The CIA and the Israelis all accused MI6 of letting all these terrorists live in London. Now, we knew about this guy, Aswat. Back in 1999, he came to America. The Justice Department wanted to indict him in Seattle because him and his buddy were trying to set up a terrorist training school in Oregon. The headquarters of the U.S. Justice Department ordered the Seattle prosecutors not to touch Aswat. Hello. Now, hold on. Why? And that's... Well, apparently, Aswat was working for British intelligence. Now, there's a split of opinion within U.S. intelligence. Some people say that the British intelligence fibbed to us. They told us that Aswat was dead, and that's why the New York group dropped the case. That's not what most of the Justice Department thinks. They think that it was just, again, covering up for this very publicly affiliated guy with al Mujahideen. He was a mm -hmm. British intelligence plant. Our CIA says, uh, okay, let's arrest him, but the Brits say no again? The Brits say no. Now, the, at this point, two weeks ago, the Brits know that the CIA wants to get a hold of Haroon. So what happens? He takes off again. Goes right to London. He isn't arrested when he lands. He isn't arrested when he leaves. Even though he's on a watch list. He's on a watch list. The only reason he could get away with that was if he was working for British intelligence. He wow. was a wanted man. And then takes off the day before the bombings, as I understand it. Yeah, and goes to Pakistan. The Pakistan, Pakistan is arrested. They jail him. They jail him. He's released within 24 hours. In London, we spoke with David Shaler, a former MI5 agent who was convicted of breaking the Official Secrets Act and imprisoned for six months. With regard to 7-7, uh, there's been a witness report uh, now included in, in a local British newspaper called the Cambridge Evening News, in which somebody who was on one of the tube trains says that he didn't see a man with a rucksack. In fact, after the explosion, what he saw was metal pointing upward from the bottom of the carriage. That would indicate, of course, that the bomb was not carried onto the tube train, but was in fact attached underneath it. Now again, nobody in the British national press is following that up. Now I hope investigating the police are.